Welcome. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us on this open audition for the Dorcas Wills Memorial Baptist Church Little Theater Company, I think is what he called it. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much for being with us this evening and coming to hear about our capital campaign. Let your light shine. If we could, before another thing is said, let's open with a word of prayer. Brother Mike Mills, would you please Amen. As I said, thank you for joining us this evening. Our desire is to give you information regarding the current situation of this beautiful facility that you're sitting in, as well as the plan that we've come up with to hopefully restore and repair and renovate the items that need attention. And um, last but not least, to tell you, how you can play a role in it. So without further ado, I want you to take a look at these faces. If you can see them, you might have to squint just a little bit. This is a photo of the groundbreaking for the building that you are presently sitting in. No, <laughs> no, that's not. <clears throat> I was gonna say, I was gonna ask Peggy, I'm glad to see you're here. Is that Reverend Snodgrass with that, with that uh, shovel? I'm not sure. He was the pastor at the time, so I wasn't sure. They do. Now, I want to point out, this picture is from 1933. It is in the throes of the Great Depression. But it did not deter this group of believers. On November 19, 1933, at a called conference, the members were told that the amount in the building fund was a whopping $15,500. At that time, Brother P.T. Sanderson made known to the church that Brother S.B. Wills, his daughter, Miss Dorothy, and son, Mr. Ben Wills, were willing to help finance the erection of a house of worship estimated at that time to cost about $20,000, provided that the church launch a building program immediately. And for those of you that have a copy of the Dorcas Wills Memorial Baptist Church history book, this can be found in the section that begins with 1932. It's some of the opening notes from it. In today's terms, that $20,000 would equate to $414,146.15. Nowhere near what would be necessary to build a structure of this size and this grandeur in this day and time. Do you agree? Well, is it my turn? No, I'm know? just asking if you agree. Not it's not your turn yet. Not <laughs> it's muted. <laughs> oh my goodness. Come here. Let me help you. <laughs> there we go. Okay, I agree. <laughs> Good Lord, they made him laugh. While it seems impossible considering the challenges that they faced, such as being in the Depression, one year later, one year Later, a new sanctuary was dedicated, November 1934, and this is a picture from the dedication. Thanks to Miss Lily Chamberlain, <laughs> we have this beautiful picture. A close examination, if you will, shows a slightly different exterior than you're used to seeing. Note up in to your, your right, yes, you're right, uh, there's dormers extruding from the top of the building. There's also a piece jutting out that I'm just not sure where it went. It, it was over there somewhere, and I'm just not sure where it is now. But through the years, you can see there have been some cosmetic changes. There's also 
two crosses over the front doors, uh, the, the double doors, there are two crosses that are no longer there. We have no idea where they are, but there are posts there where the crosses used to be. Other than that, nothing much has changed over the past 88 years until now. You can't build a structure of this magnitude and expect it to be maintenance free. Some of it takes the form of more visual actions, such as the custodial care, the yard work, even refreshing paint items like that when needed. Some maintenance efforts, however, take a much more intensive effort. Many require specialists in their field and come at a higher expense. Items such as brick maintenance, pressure washing and sealing can easily be tens of thousands of dollars simply because of the sheer size of this structure. Layer in a time element between our maintenance efforts and you can see how issues can escalate. So with that, let's take a look. Oh, that is not what's supposed to be there. That's not supposed to be there too. You want me to get back? Okay, He's, that's his way of saying stop clicking, Carol. Let's take a look at the what, Richard. What? What would you like to look at? First, we have a, <clears throat> a lot of uh, different things that have to be done in the building itself. And we've been talking for some time about the facility and how it's deteriorated over a period of time. And so we, we have come up with a plan to address those problems that exist. And we'll be going through those and show you some photographs. This is a photograph of the brick mortar around the outside of the building. And the, there are some specific areas that um, Ethan has taken photographs of. And you can see that the mortar has actually deteriorated and fallen out. When that happens, it allows moisture to get in behind that. And this structure is built in such a way that there's brick on the outside and then there's um, cinder blocks or CMU blocks in, and then there's stucco. And as that moisture begins to seep in over a period of time, you see the results of it. Just in this room, you can see the results of it on that wall where the uh, moisture has come through and it creates those bubbles as the water tries to come through. There are some ugly, ugly places that you'll see a slide on in just a moment. But this is one of the first things that has to be or had to be addressed. It currently has been repaired. Uh, we've spent several thousands of dollars, somewhere in the neighborhood of $60,000 to date. And of that $60,000, one of the major uh, tasks that we undertook was to repair these areas that had had the, um, the mortar joints fall out. We replaced them not with more mortar, but with an el elastic caulk that looks like the mortar as it dries. And it allows it to stretch and give and a lot less of uh, an intrusive act and a lot less costly than going in and trying to get all that old mortar out and put in new. So that was our approach. The building itself, the bricks themselves, for the most part around the building are sound. We did have some where if you walked up and grabbed a hold of the, the stairways, you could actually take a brick with you <laughs> because they would come off in your hand. Uh, those, we went in, pulled them off, cleaned them up, remortared them, and they're in place. And we had a few holes in our walls or around the building for various and sundry reasons that have occurred, occurred over the years. And we went in and took those holes and put new brick in them. And, and so that was the first step that we took in trying to get the, the building to a point of dryness, if you will. Uh, the second step was to then seal the building. So we took a chemical compound uh, that you spray on with a, an application. And we have now treated all of this building with the exception of one little spot on the front. And we have enough of the chemicals left over that we're going to do the same treatment on the children's center, on the brick facade of that, before it has an opportunity to deteriorate over the years. 
And so that process has taken place, and we got a good deal from the manufacturer on the uh, sealant, and so that saved us some money, and, and so we're working toward getting the outside of it dry, so then we can begin to work on the inside of it. But anyhow, that's, that's part of the problems that we've experienced over the years. This, I don't know if you can see that very well. Hopefully you can. Uh, what I'm seeing here is really small. I don't know how the choir does it. <laughs> but uh, on this, these two photographs, you can see that that is in the stairwell if you go to the balcony. And I know there are several of us who don't go to the balcony very often for various and sundry reasons. The steps is one of them. But if you walk to where the steps are and someone closes the door to the balcony upstairs, behind the door you will see that picture. And, and it is just about as ugly as you can get. And it is where the water moisture on that corner of the building specifically, but then other places as well, has really come in over the years and has created a deterioration of the stucco that is on these walls. Stucco was the last preparatory item that went into it before the finish of the building. And so that stucco has begun to uh, deteriorate, it's bubbled up, it's in really bad shape. If you walk down this hallway and go downstairs and look up, you'll actually see a big hole about the size of a manhole um, cover that's in the ceiling. And that's where over a period of time water has leaked down and has actually deteriorated the stucco and it's fallen off of the lath. So it's, it is a, a very serious problem and one that we have to fix the outside so that it dries, no longer the moisture comes in, then we can address the inside. Yeah, this area is another of the same thing. And we've actually repaired that. Uh, Cindy and I have been going here, I don't know, about 22 years, and we've repaired that wall uh, half a dozen times during that time period. Uh, but we've not repaired it with stucco, we've repaired it with other, other items, but the moisture would just continue to come in and make that paint and everything peel off. So it, we have to stop the moisture on the outside, which is the, what we've done, and then let it dry out, and then we can repair the inside. So those are pictures of what that moisture is doing. You can see it throughout the building if you know what you're looking for. You can look up at the ceiling, you can see some spots right up there, and that's rain that's come and created those problems. And we have a new roof on our building, it's only a little over a year old, and yet, um, those problems have been there for a while, and uh, it's something that we just have to continue to monitor. The stained glass windows are incredible. I don't know how many of you have ever had an opportunity to come and stand in this position and, and look back at those stained glass windows when the sun is coming through them. It is just incredible. And uh, if you go up there and look at them, uh, you can see places where the glass has fallen out and it's deteriorated. And if you are here, it's easy to see this, this window right up here. And one that uh, has bowed on inward over a period of time uh, for various reasons. And I know the reasons, but it doesn't make any difference. It's just the fact that it's now in disrepair. And some of the glass has actually fallen out of that. Uh, the little snippet that we had this morning that you did such a great job in, Carol. Um, the light that was coming through is because one of the little pieces of glass actually fell out. And that's the same thing that we have back there. So Ethan uh, called, finally found a company who specializes in repairing stained glass windows. And they came out and gave us a hard copy bid to take some of the windows that needed repairing out take them back to their shop, repair them, and bring them back and reinstall them. And uh, that's a part of the process that we'll be talking about and the funding for it. All of the windows on the outside of the building are in, in bad shape, and we'll show you that slide in just a minute. But the stained glass windows are incredibly important to this facility, in my opinion, uh, because of the beauty and the light that they bring in and the atmosphere that helps us worship. So anyhow, I'm glad that Ethan was able to find somebody 
who knew what they were talking about, had an experience in it, it's what their company does, and was willing to work with us. These are windows that are around the church. We have uh, a number of windows. I think there's 68 windows around the church. Um, and these are a couple of examples. The one, <laughs> the one that's up here on the screen to the right, I, I believe that's the pastor's old office window. Now, pastor, how long have you been in your new office? A year. A year. So for the first four years that he was here, uh, he was in the office and that was the window. And when we had the cold weather and the snow or whatever, oh yeah, it's back here. Anyhow, I was pointing to the picture rather than the actual window. But that was when his, where he was at. And the glass is actually falling down out of it. The wood is rotted. And obviously it needs to be replaced. Yes. <laughs> the windows, Brother Pastor, I love you. And I don't want you to go anywhere. The, if you look on the 94 side of the church, the lower level, we replaced those windows, um, pardon me, this past summer, and we replaced five of them over there, and that is the window that we will be using to replace all of the other windows in the church. We have replacement windows for the other side in the courtyard. There's matching windows to that inside the courtyard. And because they're protected to some degree, they're not in quite as bad a condition as those were. But the windows along 94 were in much the same condition as that one that you see up there. And the glass panes were broken and falling out. I mean, it was, it was, it was uh, ugly. And not, uh, not the, what we would want the Lord to have to say, I'm, this is where... The people are coming to worship me. But anyway, it's, it's been repaired over there. It looks very good outside and inside. And so our challenge is to replace all 68 windows uh, with that new window around the building. And that includes uh, the Sanderson building. The Sanderson building is the piece that's right next to this, if, if you're not familiar. Um, and that has windows that were replaced about 15 to 18 years ago. And those windows, when they were replaced, um, they leak, okay? Uh, there was many things that were done very good with those windows, but in, in the end, they leak. And when we have a rain today, uh, we'll have water that comes in from those windows. And so they need to be a part of the replacement process, and they are a part of the 68 count that we have. As a footnote to that, we actually keep a bucket of towels in the church office so that when it rains, we know which windows are bad and we go running with towels and put them in the windows so that the water won't come into the room and do any damage to the rooms. Yeah, the, that room, that, confer that conference room <laughs> is, um, is newly renovated. It has the new flooring in it. It has uh, all the new paint job and everything. It looks very nice. It's a very comfortable place to be. But when it rains, it does it offer rains. some challenges. <laughs> and it rained um, last, <laughs> last night, I think, or night before last, whenever it was, um, pretty hard. Um, but to, to let you know how bad the rain situation is and how it has impacted this building over the years, uh, I know of several people that over the years have had to come up here on a regular basis whenever we would have a rain and get the 15 shop vacs that we had and the mops and everything else and, and the, the little sump pumps and drain the water out of the basement because we have a basement downstairs. I don't know if you know that, but there's a real basement down there. And in this part of Texas, basements don't generally do very well. and. Um, the problem was that there was a French drain around this building that was installed in 1933, okay? And over the years, um, very little was done to maintain it. In fact, when we put gutters on the building, because you notice from that picture back in the 30s, there was no gutters, all right? The, the, the idea was to put the water from the gutters into the French drain so it would not impact the surrounding of the building. 
Well, when the French drain collapsed and nobody ever serviced it, all of that water was coming inside the facility. And it was, I, I can tell you, for 20 years, I was only a small part of the people who came with their voluntold family and vacuumed up the water on a very regular basis. So a few years ago, we rent, went in and replaced the French drain all the way around it. Dug it all up, put in new, covered it up, and we have right over here a catch basin. So if the French drain fills up before it comes into the building, it goes into that catch basin. That catch basin then has a pump on it, and it pumps the water out, sprays on the, on the grounds, and uh, keeps water from coming in. When it started raining, Cindy asked me, should you go check the church? And I said, yes, immediately got up, came up here the other night when it was raining, and started looking downstairs to make sure it was still dry, down on my hands and knees, and it was. And then I went over, and when I drove by, I didn't see the little pump spraying. And I said, Lord, I hope that thing's working. Please let me know. I go over to the window right over here and look out, and it started spraying. <laughs> I got in my truck and left, and by the time I got over here, it quit spraying. It was just enough that the Lord said, it's working, Rick. You can go home. <laughs> and so... Um, <laughs> It offers some challenges, and we're going to try to put a little monitor light on it so that you can easily drive by, and if it's in distress, a red light will come on, and we'll know we have to do something without having to ask the Lord to take his time to show me. Uh, so anyhow, this is another slide that shows the deterioration that we're suffering because of rain. These are pictures of the ceiling uh, that has fallen down. One of those slides is the hallway right behind us where the office complex used to be. And that is a, is a combination of leaks from uh, water, leaks from the rain, but also from our baptistry. The baptistry is 88 years old too. And all of that has been reworked once and is, is doing pretty well today, but it still needs some upgrades and some TLC. There's a other slide there that goes up the hallway to the third floor. There's many of you who may not even know that we have a third floor on this building. I mean, it's up there, and if you don't want to go up there, I don't blame you. Uh, but if you ever go up there, you go up this hallway, and you go up the stairs, and you look up, and you'll see all the ceiling tiles that have fallen down over the years. And that is because of roof leaks, water that's come in through the roof. Now, again, that's been repaired and replaced this past year, a year and a half ago, because of the damage that was done during the storms that we had last year. So. so now let's look at the how. After careful and prayerful study and consideration of various plans for meeting our building needs, the church has decided to move forward by church family vote with Let Your Light Shine. Matthew 5, 16 tells us, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Using this verse, we will endeavor to let our light shine as we work to restore, repair, and renovate our worship center and surrounding facilities. So how are we going to get this done? Phases. I believe that those of you that were there the evening of the business meeting when the vote was taken recall that phases were discussed. And it's just as the old adage goes, we're gonna do it one bite at a time. Using this phased approach, we'll work to raise needed funds prior to the actual work being performed. Funds raised in excess of estimated targets for each phase will roll forward to accommodate the next phase of work to be done. Once restoration has been completed for the areas that are in need, renovation will begin on projects designated to what we call phase four, part two, such as various items in the Family Life Center that need repair or replacement, such as we have a gym air conditioner that died completely, cannot be restored, and it's gonna have to be replaced. Uh, it's about $25,000. 
We also need to, uh, most of you know that we replaced the flooring in the bottom of the Family Life Center. We did not do anything on the second floor. The carpet that is upstairs has the DNA of 30 years of VBS <laughs> and youth in it, <laughs> and it needs help. Uh, we can't identify a lot of the stains. Agreed, Suzanne? Suzanne's college class just graciously goes up there, and I'm sure they go, walk around that. We don't know what that is. Just walk around it. But we already have some of the carpet. We just need to secure the rest of the carpet and do the install. And so there are items such as that that have been set at the very end of the entire project. Our total goal? $700,000. Using estimates provided by various companies that we hope to be working with, the goal for each phase has been determined. Recognizing that once a project is begun, additional issues may arise along with additional costs, there has been an amount added to the end that is a buffer or an additional unknown um, issues amounts because when we open up that stucco over there, we'll have to address whatever's behind that stucco. And so we are very aware that that could increase costs. Several items have outstanding estimates for repair, as some of our, of our contractors have told us, in order to give us a solid price point, they're gonna have to open it up. And that's very understandable. Also, over the course of the three-year effort, prices for material and labor will fluctuate. We are aware of that. Now, I am a Pollyanna, and I figure it went up, up, up during the pandemic, so now it's time for it to come down, down, down. Amen. He probably disagrees that that's going to happen, but hope holds out. <laughs> if anything is discovered, though, that is considered well outside of our campaign goal, the church body will be approached for input as to what the next steps will be. So you will stay informed along the entire way. There will be reports after a phase has, as a phase goes in, there will be reports back to the church family of what work is being done, how it's progressing so that you can see visible signs of it either through pictures or if you'd like to go on a tour of the third floor, I'll be glad to take you up there. One thing, uh, let me give you an example of a, an item that also might be out of the scope is just this last week, it has been discovered that we have active termites in a building made of wood. <laughs> so we have a plan of action from our, uh, Ethan's been working with Chris, has a plan of action that he will be providing to the deacons tonight and to the church family. Um, termites won't wait. It's not something that we can play with there. So we recognize that and it's okay. God's gonna provide. So let's talk about the who, that's us. Our plan is to raise through, sac <clears throat> excuse me, I'm gonna lose my voice now, through sacrificial giving by the members, the funds necessary to achieve our goal. Recognizing that financial resources vary widely from member to member, the call is not for equal gifts, but for equal sacrifice among our congregation. By sacrificing, not only will we meet these needs, but also be blessed in spiritual growth that comes from seeking God's will and following him. Please understand that what you see there is an image of the pledge card and we're gonna put one along with a booklet that has these pictures and more information in it in your hands in just a little bit. Understand that that pledge card says, the first two words that you see on it says before God. Notice that your name is not on it it is simply a pledge between you and God. And as you turn that card in, we will total up those amounts and we'll have a better idea of the funds that we hope to have to work with in the next three years. It's a commitment to the Lord and his provision to each of us. We ask that through prayer and personal agreement with him, that you find the level of giving that will be comfortable for you and for your family and for your situation. And as we prepare for question and answers, I'd like to ask members of our budget and finance and our facility alignment groups to come forward and have a seat. We have a spot just for you. Yes, I'm looking at you, Roy Carnes. 
and you, Mike Mills. <laughs> I'm looking around the room. You, Ethan Dalmy, come on up because, yeah, you're like a ringleader. Come here. I'm trying to see who else. There's Tony. I see Kevin. Uh, Kevin, come on. Oh, Frank's going to come. Come on, Frank. We have a microphone here in place for you to ask questions. And as you prepare to do that, Haley, Julie, would you help Haley? We have some booklets to hand out to you that also has some questions and answers already in the back of it in case it might be one that you've been prompted to ask. But we would like to take this opportunity and let you ask questions knowing that we may not have the full answer for you, but we will certainly go and find an answer for you. Thank you. We're going to let Roy run over Haley for just a moment there. <laughs> He's like, why are y'all making me come up here? There you go. I want to make sure everybody has a booklet before we start with questions and answers. What have we not made clear or what have we said tonight that has sparked further questions in your mind? And if you would come up to the mic, <laughs> please. I hate to ask. <laughs> if you, if you, yeah, if you come on up, that way everybody can hear <coughs> your question yeah. plainly. Right there. That mic. The one on the stand. Not this mic. That no, mic. just come up to the one on the stand right there. <coughs> Is the committee's idea to restore what was or to bring up the code or all of the above we will uh, have to bring things up to code where we find non-compliance so when we start doing the electrical for example if it's not within the code and we will find that we already know that to exist we will address it and bring it up so that it's safe and to the requirements that it has to be we're not in, at least in my mind we're not trying to change the look of this building. We're trying to restore the look of this building and bring it up to uh, a safety level and a code level that we can be comfortable with for the next generation. And an example of that is a year and a half ago, we had an electrical problem in the church. And our electrician that we use came and he called the uh, power company, Entergy. They sent an engineer out because we wanted to look at how we might reroute the overhead service to underground service to make it safer. And when the engineer came out, he immediately said to the electrician, I've got to cut the power off to this campus. And... <clears throat> Yeah, well, uh, we, we were running, we were running uh, four times, four times the current that our panel was able to carry. And it was outside where the children were playing, and the electrician talked him into allowing us to do the repairs, and we spent about $35,000 getting it up to code and protecting it uh, from... Um, the activities of the children protecting them from the activities that might go through that breaker panel. But that's the process that we'll use. And I can assure you, my intent is never to shortchange God as it relates to this. My first home was a 1935 vintage. And it's long enough Yeah, yeah. Uh, same question, accessibility. Except what? Accessibility. Yes, sir, uh, we, we currently, uh, like up there, no one can get there with a wheelchair. Yeah, well, oh, to the to the Baptist Church. Or you're into the choir. Yeah, uh, the Ethan has already began working on a new choir loft. Now, I, as far as how it's going to uh, mature in those drawings to accessibility, I don't know yet. But I know he's working on that. And uh, as far as getting to the baptistry, again, those will be things that we'll have to address as we address the need to update the baptistry, which is a part of this process. But you bring a very good point to light 
that it, the, the building, while it is accessible, we've done that with the elevator years ago and the ramps that we have, we have some areas that are not fully accessible. Well, none of us, uh, shall we say, senior citizens are going to get younger. Yes. So it's going to have to be provided. Yes, sir. Thank you're you. right. You remember that. Several weeks ago, we talked in Sunday school about building the wall and that the, the uh, people who were building that wall were men and women. Everybody contributed. I know that a lot of stuff that needs to be done has to be done by specialists. But is there something that we who are able-bodied can do to help with the labor issues, maybe? Yeah, it's, it is a great question. Um, and, and an example of that has already started. A few weeks ago, I was fortunate enough to be out of town when this occurred, but there was a big, massive cleanup day here at the church. And we emptied out a couple of dumpsters and uh, took that away. And that was a step to getting us able to get into some of these nooks and crannies that we haven't been able to get in in the past. And so, yes, there will be times when we can call on, we can call on all of the church family to come together and help in a particular um, needed item. If you go to the bus barn, I, many of you uh, worked on the bus barn <laughs> and uh, it took three 30-yard dumpsters plus a trailer to take all the debris out of the bus barn. We went in, we restructured it, uh, we now have it conditioned. It's air conditioned and heated. Uh, we can store uh, items, uh, records from the church. The weekday or the education ministry has the downstairs for their storage. And we can now park four vehicles, vans, vehicles in there. It has new lighting on it. And those are the steps. And much, much, much of that work was, was done and completed simply because of the people who stepped up to work in the process. So absolutely, uh, you guys will be called on, you ladies will be called on to participate at whatever level you possibly can to help this process go along and minimize the cost to the church. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, I'll say something on that too. Paul has been doing some electrical work um, uh, in and uh, out and around. Um, so if you have knowledge, um, I, I'm sure Paul would love to have you on his um, building and grounds team just to be able to, to help and address some of those issues. So, I didn't have a question, but I had some follow-up comments on what, what Dwight just said. So uh, Mike Mills is the head of the the buildings and, and grounds team and he and I and, and Ethan have been working to try to address a bunch of these problems that are that are small and we can take care of a lot of of the small things for a minimal amount of money it it will be more uh, require a little bit of labor but not necessarily skilled labor and uh, we're looking for volunteers to join the building and grounds team. So I thought I'd come up here and make a plug for that. Uh, I've, I went around, I spent a day one time about two months ago. I walked around the whole campus and I opened every closet, looked in every room and took pictures inside and outside. I've got about 125 different pictures of little things that we can do that are outside of the scope of this this campaign and we can do those things quickly for a, a fairly small amount of money we're talking about a thousand two thousand dollars versus the big things and a lot of those little things uh, while they're not really really catastrophic like the building is going to fall in uh, due to it not being addressed they are still some of those things fairly significant and a lot of them are are actually safety things that uh, that really need to be taken care of so I would invite anybody here who's who's willing to to uh, 
contribute a little bit of time to get with me and or to Mike with Mike Mills, and we will. Our intention is to go down this 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 spreadsheet that I put together and kind of set some priorities. And Mike and I have been talking about uh, since he's also on the budget committee, setting some determining you know how much money we need in the budget to address some of those things and again this is outside the scope of this discussion this evening but i think it's you know it's certainly associated with it and we need to take the opportunity to take care of some of those things i agree paul i think any and everyone who uh, would like to sign up for the building and grounds maintenance team should sign up because uh, everybody can participate in that. Uh, there have been times in the past when we simply came into the church building and cleaned and polished all the pews and woodwork in here and, you know, and, and went under the pews and scraped the gum off in some cases. Okay, so it, it, there's no commitment long term to signing up to a committee. If you just feel like you could participate, team, I'm sorry. Well, thank you, Roy. Thank you, Roy. Thank you, Roy. Uh, all you have to do is just get on that roll, and that team can call you at any time and say, hey, we're going to do this. Can you show up? And if you can, you do. And th that's the beauty of it is there's no commitment. You can sign up. You can be on call. And if you can, you can come. And if you can't, you'll make it the next time. So thank you, Paul, and you're very right. And thank you, Roy, for that correction. Yes, ma'am. Carol, I, I believe I heard you say something about three years just in your comments. Is there a projected schedule, a preferred schedule for these phases? The desire is to be able to complete it within the three years if possible. Uh, there are some items that, for example, the drying out of these walls, so they had to get it pointed and sealed, and then you wait because you have to let it dry out. And so you can't just turn around and say, oh, got it done, so the next thing is start scraping that stucco and get it all taken care of. You can't do that, you've got to let the interior dry. And so that may be six months to a year before they can tap in. They'll test the moisture <laughs> levels before they go into it. And so you, they'll, that'll be a year. So yes, that's why the three year projection, um, allowing those things, and. It's interesting because, and let me give you an example. If you'll notice these ceiling tiles that we have in this room, you can no longer get these ceiling tiles. Now our desire is not to replace all these ceiling tiles because a lot of them are perfectly fine. So how do we pull it off? Well, one way we could pull it off is to come up into the choir, change those tiles out so that they all match. Then automatically we have all of those tiles to use as replacement tiles throughout the rest of the building. So it's like you move from this step to this step. In your booklet, we have the phases defined so that you'll see phase one, two, three, you'll see phase four, part A, or part one, and then phase four, part two. And there are estimates of values placed with each one, understanding that if we have to delay on something because say the moisture does not go away when anticipated, but we have the opportunity to move to something else, then we'll just reallocate and move to the next item that's on those lists. And I didn't mean to point you all into the books. <laughs> I, that's why we waited to give you the books. <laughs> so I was gonna say, please read the books. It'll give you a better definition of each one of those. And I failed to tell you when I told you our goal of $700,000, we actually have already received over $100,000 of that $700,000 goal. Just from letting individuals know that we were beginning this campaign there were individuals that felt compelled to go ahead and start contributing. And so we have received a little over 100,000 so far toward that goal. And that's the, and that's the money that we used to do, to the, do the, the ceiling of, of the outside and, and the work that we've done. So we're not in deficit in any way, shape or form as it relates to the work that's already been done. Uh, we've spent about $60,000 of the money that's, that we've taken in. 
Are we going to try to put a hold on more mills being taken out and just for the time being, just trying to, with Sam, uh, not adding to the list? Are you talking about the grocery ministry? Yes. Not that I'm aware of, no. This oh. shouldn't impact that at all. Okay. This should not have any impact. Our grocery ministry does have a budget line. Well, it has a designated budget line. So it comes through the private contributions of individuals here in the church. And so it's fully funded in that manner, separate and apart from what this is. Okay. My yeah. second question is, have y'all thought about fundraisers such as, I know there's some ladies here that they'll bake cakes or cookies or whatever to try to raise some money or having some barbecue uh, dinners and trying to sell dinners as well. The, that's something that can always be considered down the line if necessary. Uh, typically with a capital campaign like this, you go to your membership first and let them make their commitment uh, before you even consider anything additional. Um, and, and because it is a commitment between them and the Lord with the money that they're going to contribute toward the effort. So thank you. We can consider that as we move forward. Yeah, please. Years ago, I was, I have been heavily convicted to overall not do fundraisers within the church. I believe that God has put here everything that, that we need to accomplish our goals. And I do not want to send a message that he hadn't to our community, come by our barbecue so we can continue with the ministries that God has called us to do. And I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, we, I had a young man, when I was, or an older gentleman, when I was in youth ministry. And I was out doing these fundraisers. I was, we were... I have nothing against our, our youth work, and believe me, Sam and I are right on the same page with that. But we would do car washes and a couple other things. And I had one of my men come to me. He said, uh, Brother Greg, I would rather, and, and God would rather see you. And he's very convicted, and I agree, out there winning souls for the Lord, teaching these children as opposed to going to, uh, to Walmart and having a car wash where you're going to raise 200 bucks. And he said this, too. He said, when you have a need, you come and let me know. And I will tell you, not only him, but several other within that church, whenever there was a need, they stepped right up and met it. And, I, and I've been in other churches where they were selling knives, they were selling candy, they were selling other things. And it was always something but that was raising kind of piddly amounts of money to really the exception of giving glory to God for what he's accomplishing. And even as I said this morning, and I, I, I'll, rep I'll repeat this again, we will go far with this project as the Lord provides. And we're not going to get in debt. And I, I appreciate so much the offer, but I want you to know, we even, even here, we used to do a garage sale to help with things. And I'm not against a garage sale, but here's what I want to see us do. Let's give it away. Let's bring it in and give it away and minister to our community because we don't need the money that way. And I, I just, you know, I really strongly believe that. And I think probably when y'all hear my thinking and the way the Lord has led me, you, you, would, you would agree. Let's, let's give it away. Let's see what, how the Lord blesses us then. So I don't know, does that, does that fully address? I'm just making sure I haven't skipped over something. But anyway, I appreciate your comment because I know in your heart you're wanting to, to help us get this completed, but, but we will, and the Lord's going to bless us as we take that approach. Thank, thank you. <clears throat> I wanted to also address that it is not the intent in any way, shape, or form of the capital campaign to take away from the ministries that we are already involved in. Those ministries are what we've been called to do, and we're going to do them. This campaign is over and above it's a sacrificial campaign, if you will. It should not impede your tithe. It should not impede your offering. And it should not impede your special gifts that you give on a regular basis. This is over and above. This is prayer. This is God, tell me what you want me to do and help me do it. Because he will. Uh, I will tell you, and if you come to the business meeting, 
on Wednesday night, you'll hear a part of this same presentation. I'm just going to throw this in. But when we started the Children's Center, uh, it was estimated that it was going to cost us about a million dollars. Is that right, Roy? We ended up spending about 700000 because we had a number of people who stepped up and gave us uh, excellent work and minimized their bids throughout the building of that building. Uh, one contractor gave us a price and then came in $20,000 under. Instead of saying, here's my bill, he cut it by $20,000 because he was able to do what needed to be done for less money. And we hope that will happen again. But in the, in the startup of that building, we had a building campaign that was not widely um, advertised. The pastor at that time went out, talked to a few people, collected uh, some commitments, got a uh, couple of hundred thousand dollars, we got started. And within the first three years, we have, I think the number is around $300,000, $350,000. That'll be a part of the presentation that we'll give Wednesday night. You should come to the business meetings. You find out a lot of wonderful things about your church there. But <laughs> there are people who stepped up. And we have one, one person who stepped up who never set foot in this church other than to come in and say, I have a piece of property on Highway 19 that I want to give to the church. And he did. And we sold it <laughs> for $150,000, roughly. So I'm telling you, folks, God answers our prayers, and he's ahead of us on this. Well, the, um, the daycare grant money be used in this endeavor the amount of money that we have listed for this capital campaign is purely money to be raised uh, it's separate and apart from any of that and so it's our desire that we're able to pay for all of the renovations and restorations through the additional gifts of our church family you may be able to participate in giving in ways you may not even have thought of. Uh, for example, uh, I have a lady who came to me and said, you know, I've got a bunch of scrap steel and stuff at my house that I need to get rid of. And so my response was, we'll make arrangements to come pick it up. We'll take it to the scrap yard and we'll sell it and we can take whatever that money is and put it toward the building campaign. Who knows? You may have an old tractor sitting somewhere or an old car sitting somewhere, and we can pick those up. You may have uh, some old jewelry that you have. Your, your senior ring from high school, probably not wearing that very often. Um, you, you may want to sell that gold. Gold is up, okay? You may have some silver coins somewhere. There, there, are, there are hidden treasures that all of us have that maybe it's time to give those treasures over to God rather than let them collect dust in the drawer in your closet. Rick, several years ago, there was a uh, presentation made to the church about the minimum required distribution from IRA accounts. You can designate that money to go directly to the church, and when you do that, you're not taxed on it because it's going from you to the church. Now, if you take your distribution, your minimum required distribution, and it comes in your name, then you're going to be taxed. But if you want to make a, a contribution to the church through this uh, minimum required distribution and you structure it properly, you need to either get with your CPA or your financial advisor to make this happen but you can contribute money to the church and you'll not be taxed on that withdrawal. And if you're over 72 years old and you have an IRA, if you don't make that minimum required distribution, the tax is about 50%. So it's in your best interest to investigate the option of of taking it out, whether you give it to the church or not, is your your decision. But uh, this is one venue or avenue for 
for making making that contribution and protecting yourself from some taxes. Sir, and Roy was one that, that brought that to us, and uh, maybe it's a time to bring it back and have it talked about again. It's not limited to the requirement. It's, it's, it's not, here's a microphone. Roy, Roy's saying it's not limited to just that uh, amount. Hello. It's not uh, limited to the RMD. You can make uh, any amount, almost. I think it's got some limit, which is big, 100000 You can take your IRA and give that straight to the church. You have to go to your financial institution. And then it's like it never happened as far as taxes. You don't get any tax. It just goes to the church, and that's it. Now, I know that's, you know, uh, you know, that's just a way you can do that. Uh, and there, are, you can, you can save some money. You could uh, give your tithe and offerings to the church directly from the RA instead of writing a check for it, and you've saved yourself that tax money right there. Just make sure you have your company make a notation on the check for if you want it for general fund or capital campaign, so forth and so on. Uh, we have individuals across our entire uh, membership that do that, but just make sure they make a notation for you, and they'll do it. My question is about the Baptist men's organizations. Uh, my son won the state missions fair with his presentation on them 15 years ago over at uh, Lake Tomahawk Baptist Camp. The camp builders came along, the furniture builders came along, the cabinet builders came along, all groups out of the Baptist men. They bring their RVs, they go to work. You're from Louisiana, you probably never heard of Texas Baptist men, but they exist, okay? But are we utilizing those resources? So looking and, and complying with their regulations and rules online. Um, they don't have rules. Well, so they have certain things like you have to provide a stay. You have to provide somewhere uh, food. You have to provide places for their sewer and electricity. Um, and these are all the rules from their website. Um, and um, and we, because uh, originally, because uh, they don't charge for labor, um, the only thing they charge for is materials. And uh, so originally when we got in this process, that was the first thing we looked at. Um, because, I mean, they're very skilled. And then there's a few church members that have participated in it before. Um, and so after directly uh, looking at all the rules and regulations, they do not do renovation. That's their one thing. They do building, um, and then they'll do minor things, um, but we're too big of a picture for them. Um, but that's, that's, like I said, with complying with all of their rules. Your choir room didn't qualify for disaster relief. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Someone else, anyone else? We are getting to the end of our time. Is this a yellow okay over there? Yeah. We're getting to the end of our time this evening. I'm sure that there are going to be questions that will pop up along the way. And one of the last things that we tell you in the booklet is that if you have questions, call the church office. We would be glad to make a note and get it to the appropriate team member to get information back to you. Uh, so please do not walk away thinking that, oh, I remember this afterwards, and who do I ask or what do I do? Yes, sir. Good, uh, an idea, uh, uh, based on what you just said, perhaps we can put a, on a web page questions that have been asked, frequently asked questions that will help people. Absolutely. Uh, if you go to our church web page, in fact, you will notice that there is a I'm trying to remember what it's called, uh, and I know you guys can't call it up up there. It is either Capital Campaign or Building cap, uh, building Restoration. It's got a name. They are building out a page for it specifically, and so we can put those Q&As on there. And uh, another way that you can always <coughs> ask a question, excuse me, is uh, you can also email the church office. If Yes, ma'am. It's called Building Restoration. 
Thank you. It's called Building Restoration. She called it up on her phone. And so it's under construction right now, and that's a great place for us to drop questions and answers and then build that out. Also, we're also going, our, our strategy is to provide pictures of renovations as they occur so that you can see updated information there as well. And it'll be at your leisure. You can go out there and click on it and get that information easily. You'll have the before and after? Oh, I don't know about all that. He says yes. We have the before. We have lots of before. So that's a good point. Do a before and after. Yes. You know, I would love for people to see what the second floor same school department looked like before. before we renovated it for adult one. Yeah, I don't know if any of you were up, the children's leaders were, and they know the catacombs that it used to be upstairs. Um, and now to go into it, and it's been renovated for Adult One, and it's a beautiful space, beautiful coffee bar, beautiful classrooms, and um, I know that I have been here a really long time, and I have seen that space be remodeled three times. And so I remember when they turned it into the catacombs that the children's department used, and then subsequently now, it's beautiful. And so again, the idea, Dennis, is you know to renovate to the point that we have to to bring it safe, inviting, but yet respect the history that is in this building. Because just look around you and think about the people in this room in November in 1934, raising their voices in praise. And you're sitting here today. So let's think. 88 years ahead because they were thinking about us back then let's think about them with what we're about to do Madam Secretary. <laughs> this physical building is a cornerstone of the city of trinity anyone who passes through trinity or lives in trinity passes that intersection. As chairman of the deacons, and also a member of the budget team, I have been compelled to ask our other deacons to work diligently on the membership of this church. We have over 450 members of this church on the rolls. However, we have more on the inactive roles than we do on the active roles. Now many are inactive and many have moved away, but it is my thrust and I have asked the deacons to contact every member of the church on the roles and ask them what they need spiritually and to return to this church. Now I'll step aside and be on the budget side, which says, if we can double the size of those in this room tonight, that will lessen the amount of sacrificial giving that we will all have to do. And these large numbers can be met more efficiently. Thank you. I know Dairy Queen is calling some of you, so I do not want to delay any longer. It's a little after seven, but I also want to make sure that anyone that would like to ask any questions is heard. Okay, in that case, we are going to ask our pastor to step forward <coughs> and close us out with his words. Thank you for being here. And thank you for every input, the questions, the suggestions. I know it's on your heart to accomplish what the Lord wants. I, I just want to reiterate what Carol did, even on Wednesday nights. When we have our, our conferences, our church and business meeting, come and ask your questions. That's the time to do that. We can, you know, we will make time for that also then. In your booklet, I don't think I see a page number, but turn to the letter that I have written. It's probably about page three. You know, start with Dear Church Family. 
And when you find that, just say, I got it. All right. This is our prayer tonight. This is Look at the very bottom. I want us to, to uh, say this scripture together and let it be our prayer. This is from Psalm 90, verse 17. And yeah, I know y'all, if you need your glasses, get your glasses out. I'd... Everybody got it out here? Okay. I, want to, I really want us to read it together. This will be our prayer in the name of Jesus. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for being here. Let me, let me also... Thank the thank the two of you. We we appreciate the presentation and thank you guys too. And as you go, I'm sorry. Thank you, Sharon. Sharon has a couple of baskets full of visual reminders for you. They are small light bulbs that have our campaign verse on it, Matthew 5:16, and we would love for you to take one with you. Uh, your challenge is, if you'd like to, take the top off and fill it up with money and bring it back. Um, but it's only going to hold cash or checks <laughs> or dimes. If you have a lot of dimes, it'll hold a dime, but you can't get a quarter in it <laughs> or a penny or a nickel. So please take one with you. Put it there in, and have it as a visual reminder of our goal. And thank you very much again for being here with us.